गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग राकेश Rakesh, you wanted some um, input regarding um, um, career advice, right? <clears throat> Rakesh, can you hear me? Sir, 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 yes, sir. I'll give you a call tomorrow morning, and I'll uh, have a chat with you. Okay. Okay, sir. On other days, it's Thank a bit you, busy. Yes, yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah. Just let's wait a couple of minutes. I don't know if people will come today, Saturday, you know, evening. So Saturday evening is always dicey. Okay, so good evening to all. How many? Right now there are seven. Good evening to all of you. Let's get going. I would ideally like to finish off with this discussion on the parliament, though. I won't be able to discuss the. I won't be able to finish it totally because what we can finish today is that uh, we will probably finish the discussion on the British Parliament, uh, but we will have to uh, still do the American Parliament, which is a very different model. And there again, uh, history has shaped that particular Parliament. So let's not start talking about the British Parliament now we should be talking about, I mean, sorry, about the American Parliament now. Let's continue to talk about the British Parliament. Yesterday, I was trying to tell you that the Parliament in Britain gained substantial powers uh, during the Reformation 
because of the idiosyncrasies of Henry VIII and his conversion uh, of an entire nation into Protestantism. And it also, uh, I told you, is one more important thing to remember is that he, instead of having a religious uh, person as the head of the Anglican Church, as opposed to the Roman Church, he had himself a king. He had himself as the head of that church. In order to do all this, see, being the head of the church is just not a nominal thing. Okay, you must understand that being the head of the church essentially means that the church properties will also come under your control. Okay, and uh, in order to do that, in order to do that, in order to bring the properties of uh, the church under control, under his control, he needed the support of the parliament, especially the lords, especially the lords. And that is the reason why they became a smidgen more important than those who were the commons. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so you will see that presently a similar thing is happening in India. Okay, uh, minority religions, uh, the properties of the minority religions whichever religion it may be, whatever properties they have, whatever earnings they have, all these things are very much under the control of those committee, uh, the, the, the committees that are formed by these uh, different bodies of different religions. For instance, if you want to look at who controls Muslim properties, okay, uh, that is something that is done by the Waqf Board, WKF, Waqf Board that takes care of the properties of the Muslims, right? And if you look at the properties of the Sikhs, Sikhs, I'm sorry, not Sikhs, Sikh is how it is to be pronounced, S-I-K-H. The Sikhs, and for heaven's sake, please don't call them Sardarjis, huh? Please. Uh, so if you look at the Sikhs, then everything that they do comes under the Shiromani Akali Dal. So off late, there has been a lot of clamor about why Hindu uh, temples and their properties come under the government department. Okay, why do they come under the government department? And uh, you have this department called the Department of Endow Endowments. Okay, and it is under the endowments department that these temples come. You must understand that there is a property amount also cited. If the income of a temple is not very high, then it doesn't come under the endowments department. 
if it's a small temple but if it's a big temple and big in terms of its earnings uh then it comes under the endowments now please remember this was done originally by the british okay this was done originally by the british the british took uh the i mean they said all religious properties will have to come under the endowments the only thing that happened after the change uh in government which is when india became independent the minorities were exempted from this rule of coming under the endowments so today the hindutva people they are saying if these people have been exempted why not why don't we exempt even the money that is there which is coming and uh, which comes under the category of temples and uh, other religious hindu religious institutions okay so i don't want to go into that debate uh the reason why i mentioned it is that this was done by the british in india and it was in line with what henry the 8th did okay when india became a vice royalty that is when this happened okay and it is very much in line with the uh uh with with the actions of henry the 8th uh as the head of the anglican church he said all the properties will belong to uh the monarch and the parliament okay and in the parliament he tended to consult the lords more than the knights it is not to say that the knights were not consulted but it was the lords who were consulted and that is when they started uh appear uh, beginning to become the upper house now if you look at after what happened with henry the 8th i told you that you had a very bad period under the rule of queen mary who tried to reconvert the uh, island kingdom uh, the with the parts that were called uh, great britain and england she tried to reconvert them to catholicism because of her mother and her grandfather who were catholics and spanish and uh, she failed miserably and that is when the parliament the british parliament played a very very important role okay it played a very very important role in foiling the designs of uh queen mary okay um they basically it was the parliament that took the initiative to lead a fight so without the support of the parliament she was very helpless as a result of which uh she was removed from power and she was replaced by her sister a step sister actually elizabeth who was the daughter of anne boleyn so i had talked to you about all this 
yesterday and i told you that the people consider the rule of queen elizabeth the first now that we have an elizabeth the second we have to refer to this lady as queen elizabeth the first if you look at it then this particular period was very peaceful because she was installed more or less by the parliament with the active support of the parliament and that basically meant that she had a cordial relationships relationship i'm sorry uh with uh the parliament and this cordial relationship culminated in some meaningful power sharing between uh the what should i say uh between um the queen and the parliament okay and therefore it was a very very good period in british history and this period is called the golden period i told you that uh, this is the time when great writers like geoffrey chaucer william shakespeare all these people flourished art flourished okay and england saw unprecedented growth Eco- economically as well so it was a good time all around till she was queen and when she was gone which is when she died then there was a problem because she hadn't married and she did not have a husband so there would she didn't have children so that was the end of the tudors okay the tudor dynasty came to an end but they had set a precedent where the parliament was sharing quite a few powers even though the lancastrians also did the same thing uh the tudors required the help of the parliament the lancastrians were just a weak dynasty who relied on the help of the parliament but uh, that is not the case with uh, what should we say it is not the case with the tudors from henry the 8th onwards they willingly shared the power even though they were quite powerful themselves and like i said one factor which differentiates what happened during the lancastrian period from what happened in the tudor period is the fact that the properties of the church the income of the church all of them were now available to the parliament and the king or the queen okay so that is an extremely important development okay and uh, once the tudor dynasty came to an end the british went in search of a new dynasty when we say the british went it is actually the parliament it's actually the parliament that uh, went in search of a new dynasty and that particular dynasty happened to be oh.
please don't use the other spelling. By mistake, I used in uh, yesterday's class, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, -E the Stuart. Uh, both mean they are different spellings. The pronunciation is the same. This is the correct spelling. In yesterday's class, I made the mistake of, uh, nowadays people don't use this spelling so much as they do S-T-E-W-A-R-T -E when they use it as a second name or their surname. Okay, uh, but when they use it, somehow the Americans, I think, have made uh, Stuart uh, first name. So you have that film about that little mouse, Stuart Little, as it is called, right? And so you have uh, uh, Stuart as a first name, and the Americans are crazy. They also have first names like Rowdy, R O W D Y. Why will anyone have a name like Rowdy? Okay, but one of the greatest Olympians, uh, swimmer and diver, who won quite a few Olympic medals, was uh, a chap called Rowdy Gaines. Okay, and they have all these funny names. So the, the yesterday's spelling is wrong. Okay, please keep this in mind. It is Stuart written with S-T-U-A-R-T and not S-T-E. So the Stuart dynasty came into being. The Stuart dynasty was a very, very ambitious dynasty. The kings were very ambitious. They wanted they wanted absolute power. Let me add for themselves. Okay, they were not willing to share power with the with the parliament, nor were they willing to even consult them over matters of administration, and uh, over matters of administration and governance. Okay. They were not willing to share the power. They didn't want to con even have. They saw the existence of the parliament as a threat to themselves. So they did something unprecedented. Okay. They did something which is very, very unprecedented. And that is they tried to eliminate 
this institution they try to eliminate it so that you know it otherwise they felt it would be like the proverbial sword of democles how many of you have heard about the sword of democles hmm has anyone heard of the sword of democles no well it comes from greek mythology yeah akshay you were saying something no sir no okay sword of democles is in greek mythology and this is supposed to hang on the heads of those who need to be punished okay so it can fall on you any time and you can get decapitated decapitated is your head can go for a complete detachment from the rest of your body okay that is the brief explanation of the sword of democles it comes from greek mythology and today it has become a proverb you say i have the sword of democles hanging on my head and when you say something like that what you're saying is that there is a threat of something okay that there is a threat of something that's hanging on your head so the proverbial sword of democles they thought the parliament can become that and they didn't want it to so they wanted to get rid of it okay it started mainly with the knights the knights were disempowered they tried to take away the lands of the lords okay they said the parliament stands abolished so they did all this terrible things okay and the person who was mainly responsible for this was charles the second king charles the second was the person who was mainly responsible for this so the parliament was emasculated and what remained of it was a purely powerless body 
okay whatever remained of it was just a powerless body the charles i mean charles the second he refused to accept the existence of the parliament okay and this is how things carried on till 1640 <clears throat> 1648 CE this is how uh, the this is how it was till 1648 CE but what happened was by then there was growing discontentment among the people okay because of the tyrannical rule due to the tyrannical rule of the Stuart Kings, and here in this case, we're talking about Charles the second. Okay, we find that the people also were completely unhappy with them. And there was a popular uprising. Okay. against the king. So at this time, the king felt very vulnerable. So what he did is he tried to get the support of the parliament. He tried to get the support of the parliament and he found that there wasn't much of a parliament left. So he convened what is today called It was called the Rump Parliament because the rump actually refers to the posterior, lower part of the body. It was called the Rump Parliament because only that was left. No head, no shoulders, none of them. Okay. And because of the parliament not being there at all, in adequate strength to defend Charles II, you have a rebellion led by
Oliver Cromwell led a, led a rebellion and deposed the king. Okay. So, from here onwards, for a dozen years or so, you will see you will see the rule of Oliver Cromwell which was described which can be described as a a puritanical dictatorship. Akshay, you said you heard of Cromwell. Have you heard of puritanical? Akshay. I couldn't listen to you, sir. Huh? I couldn't listen to you. You couldn't listen to me? Yes, sir. So are you able to listen to the lecture? Hello, Akshay. Are you able to listen to the lecture? Yes, sir. Have you heard of puritanical dictatorship or what is puritanical? Have you heard of that word? You said you heard of Oliver Cromwell. Yes, sir. Yeah. So did you hear about puritanical? I heard about uh, puritanism, sir. Right. Puritanical <laughs> comes from puritanical, puritanism only. What is puritanism? Um, people from uh, England uh, established a religion in America, which is uh, pure. They think that uh, that uh, religion is pure, which is different from the religion that present in uh, England. Akshay, who told you this story? I was not able to describe it properly, but it was told by my English lecturer, sir. Next time you go, take a gun with you and shoot him. Seriously. Sir, sir I, I am explaining it uh, differently, but he told correct. It has nothing to do with America. It has absolutely nothing to do with America. Okay, it has everything to do with Protestantism. Okay, Protestantism came up, as I told you yesterday, because of Martin Luther and this was brought into the British nation or the English nation by Henry VIII, but Martin Luther himself uh, decided <clears throat> that a true Christian, okay, a true Christian has to live a life of austerity and hardship okay 
This is in fact the basis of what Max Weber called Protestant ethic. I'll talk to you about that. It's a very important thing in the context of political science. Not now, but I'll talk to you at some point. Not just political science, it's there in all social sciences. Okay. Martin Luther believed that you should live a life of austerity. Does anyone understand what is austerity? Hmm? Living, uh, leading a life without any pleasures, I mean, comforts, luxuries. Yeah. Being austere is not having comforts, not having all those things that people have. Living a life of uh, simplicity. Okay, the best example of austerity that you can think of is Gandhi. Okay, Gandhi never ate food till his stomach filled up. He used to take a small meal and he only used to drink a little bit of goat's milk. Okay, that's austerity. He slept on the floor. He didn't have a mattress and all those things. He just slept on the floor. Okay, that is austerity. Right? And that is what was preached by Martin Luther. A life of austerity, which also is a life of hardships. Okay, but no comforts. So it's also by derivation. It is a life of hardship. So this particular principle of Martin Luther gave rise to Puritanism in England. In England, it came to be called Puritanism. Okay which is living a life of austerity and hardship. But it doesn't have only one name. It was called It was called Presbyterianism in Scotland. Okay, this extreme form of Protestantism. Puritanism in England, Presbyterianism in Scotland, Calvinism in France, Lutheranism <clears throat> in Germany, they all promoted this life of austerity and hardship. So it is described as an extreme form of pro of protestantism protestantism obviously of christianity in in christianity okay so you will find all these different forms of uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, different iterations, if you can call them that, of the spirit of Lutheranism, which was to live a life of austerity and hardship. Okay, now Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan. Okay, and so he decided that England will become puritanical. Not just Protestant, but it will become puritanical. And his dictatorship, which lasted a dozen years, like I said, is something that promoted this life of austerity and hardship and opposed anything materialistic, It opposed anything materialistic. And so what did he do? He created a court King's Court, huh? that is what it is. Court of Puritans from various walks of life. And since Akshay is an Englishman, and since I also studied this, you find this man, John Milton, the poet. He was also in the court of Oliver Cromwell. Akshay, do you remember the story of John Milton? I don't know, but he wrote Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained. Why? Why did he write those? Hmm? I don't know. No? Okay. Milton became blind. due to an ailment. At that time, he wrote this near epic length poem called Paradise. lost okay because he lost his sight at that time he wrote this particular poem paradise lost you know paradise right not the one opposite those of you who are from pg college not the one opposite that not that paradise paradise as in the Christian paradise, heaven. Okay, so losing sight made him write this poem called Paradise Lost. And then when Cromwell took over England and established a puritanical rule, Milton also became a Puritan. And when he became when he called him and made him a member of his court, Oliver Cromwell, 
then milton wrote the other poem which is also of almost an epic length it is called paradise regained okay so when he said paradise lost it was personal it was very very personal because he lost his sight he said paradise lost but paradise regained is the establishment of a puritanical way of life in england the imposition of a puritanical way of life in england which he thought will be very good so the paradise that is regained is the england which was puritanical england under uh, oliver cromwell was supposed to be like paradise like heaven so when he said paradise regained it's not personal paradise lost is personal paradise regained is not personal but it is about an entire country please remember that okay and since cromwell had become a dictator cromwell became a merciless dictator who punished people severely if they deviated from puritanism okay so he became this terrible dictator which was also the case with john calvin john calvin in france he established his own version of it of of the spiritism and so strict and disciplinarian was he john calvin that is that he ordered the killing of a one year old baby because it disobeyed its mother so that is how these were these extreme forms of protestantism they were terrible okay and punishments given were always death or even if it was not death it was something terrible torture not like say go and sit in a jail and watch tv we'll put the air conditioner on which is what our politicians get not that kind of punishment but torture or death one of these two so you will find that cromwell became intolerable as far as people were concerned and cromwell was ousted
Cromwell was ousted from his position as ruler of England. Okay. I don't know if Milton wrote a poem again, Paradise Lost Again. I don't know if he did that. But whatever it is, Cromwell was removed from power and now again the question was who's going to rule England? So what do they do? They bring back the Stuart dynasty. This time it is James the second. Okay. And James the second was no different from Charles the second. James the second went back to this idea. This idea of having power for themselves. Oh, why did I remove that? He went back to the idea of having power. Again, the attempts at absolute monarchy were made yet again, that whole process started. Whatever was there of the parliament tried to resist it. And when James the second wouldn't heal, meaning he wouldn't listen to them, then they decided they have to get rid of James the second. So what do, what does the parliament do? The parliament asks for the help of England in order to depose James the second but the parliament has not yet rebuilt the way it was supposed to be people gave their support to the parliament but it was not an easy task to get rid of James the second so what do they do They approach they approach the King of Scotland and request him to invade England. By that time, even in the ranks of the English 
soldiers who were with James the Second, there was discontent brewing. There was discontent brewing, and so what happens? What happens is that they start deserting the army and seeing that the people of England were against him, not just the parliament, and that even desertions were taking place in the army, James II saw the writing on the wall. Okay, he saw the writing on the wall, which was, you are no longer going to be king. Then he came to know about the invasion that was going to happen from the King of Scotland. And before that in invasion happened, James the second abdicated his throne to save himself and went into exile. James II abdicated his throne to save himself and went into exile. So nothing happened. This was in the year 90, uh, 1688. And the abdication of James II came to be called the glorious revolution of 1688. Okay, they called it a glorious revolution because they got rid of a king without having to go to war against him. Okay, so this is a landmark thing. Now, at this time, the parliament started rebuilding itself to what it was. And then they again decided that they need to find somebody to come and rule them. Okay? They decided they actually need somebody to come and rule them. So they went in search of a monarch and they found a couple, not a couple of monarchs, but a couple, a married couple that is, called William and Mary of Orange. William and Mary of Orange were invited. Now, William and Mary of Orange were a bit reluctant, not a bit reluctant. They were very, very reluctant. Okay? Because they were scared of how many times the kings were being changed. Charles II, Oliver Cromwell, James II, and till they were picked up in the interim period, it was the King of Scotland who also officiated as the King of England. And so they were afraid that they'll get thrown out again. So at that time, the parliament 
did something unprecedented in the history of the world. And that is They said they are surrendering their rights, including the right to revolt against the king this is not taught either in history or in political science okay and when we are talking about sir yes yes sir sir that mean is this the example of what john lock said Thomas Hobbes said. Thomas Hobbes. Yes. Thomas Hobbes basically said that you have to surrender your rights to the Leviathan, who is the sovereign. Okay. You have to surrender your rights in order to have peaceful life. So Hobbes, who was a target of the anger of almost everyone when he published the Leviathan, suddenly became the role model. Suddenly became the role model and people said, you be sovereign. We will surrender our natural rights. The rights here are not yet constitutional rights because there is no constitution nothing of those things have been talked about as yet okay so people said we are surrendering our natural rights this is unprecedented it didn't happen elsewhere in the world anywhere else in the world okay so, this is also the bone of contention between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine. Edmund Burke believed that even the rights of the future generations were given away to or were surrendered to the sovereign power for the sake of peaceful living. And he said it was imperative that he saw that as a social contract, by the way. He saw that as a social contract. And he said people have to stick to this. Thomas Paine, on the other hand, said, why should we? Who are they in the past to give away our rights in the future? Our rights are ours. Somebody can't give away something that is not yours. So let me tell you an amusing story here. 
Uh, just to take the seriousness out of the thing. I had two cousins. I have, sorry. Brothers. The elder fellow was a very, very good boy. The younger fellow was a mischievous fellow. So their mother, these are actually my nephews. They are not much older than me, not younger, much younger than me. So they call me their cousin, but actually they'll be my nephews. The mother is my cousin. She said that we'll go to Tirupati and she decided you have that system of Mokku Kodam. So she said she'll get both these fellows tonsured. They'll, she'll get their heads shaved. Okay. So we were all going to Tirupati together. And when the first fellow came to know that he's going to get tonsured, he said, okay. My mother said, I have to get tonsured, so I'll get tonsured. The second fellow had a huge problem. Very, very huge problem. He kept on asking throughout the journey. Throughout the journey, he kept on asking, how did you decide that you will get my head shaved? And he answered, he asked, they were kids, mind you. I was also a kid. And he kept on asking his mother, hmm? How can you decide that you will get my head shaved? It's my head. How could you say that you will get it shaved? So they had to bribe him and do all that. But finally, he got his head shaved. So that is exactly what Thomas Paine was doing. He was asking, who are they to give away our rights? Our rights are our rights. Okay, and he broke his friendship with Burke. They became estranged. And Payne, Thomas Payne wrote two works against Burke. One was this essay, Common Sense in which he argues against Burke, saying that he doesn't have common sense. Why? Because if he had common sense, would he have even argued that you can, our forefathers have given away their rights and our rights. They gave their rights away, their rights, fine. That is fine. But how did they give our rights away? Does that make any sense to you? So that's what he meant by common sense. And it was directed squarely at Edmund Burke. He told him there is no way you can give away something which is yours. Then he went a step forward and wrote the rights of man. Kavya, are you there? Have you left? Kavya, I'm there, sir. You're there? Yes, sir. Hmm. You did human rights, no? No, sir. You didn't do that course on human rights? No, sir. Okay. 
Okay. I said this before, I'm saying it again. I'm sorry, I have a way of repeating myself. In Usman University, people will say that human rights, the first document is Magna Carta. That's not human rights. Please. Okay. You must understand that Hobbes was the first to talk about rights called them natural rights okay which he wanted surrendered then it was John Locke who also talked about natural rights, but he wanted them to be retained. He wanted the rights to be retained. He said, no need to give away, no need to surrender the rights. That's the difference between the natural rights of Hobbes and the natural rights of Locke. More of it when we, well, I've already done it with my students in PG college. Those of you who are my students in arts college, you will hear about all these things when we come to the social contractualists, okay? But the person who bunged a spanner in the works or in the talk of natural rights is the skeptic. Remember, it was this morning or was it yesterday, Akshay? that I was talking to you about philosophical skepticism yesterday, right? Epicureanism, Hellenistic Greece. Yes, sir. Yeah. So philosophical skepticism. So there was a philosophical skeptic in the modern period as well. And his name is David Hume. Now, what David Hume wanted to know was what are these natural rights? If they are rights given by nature, who told you that you have these rights? Through what medium did nature convey to you that rights are given to you and these are your natural rights? Hume raised that particular question. He said, how can you justify natural rights? Okay, so that is how utilitarianism was born. But apart from utilitarianism, people do not mention Thomas Paine in Osman University. They never heard of him. In the rights of man, Thomas Paine argues against this kind of skepticism that you find in David Hume, that the 
rights are given to all human beings because they are human beings. Okay. And he also said, oh, wonderful. He also said, it is not possible to alienate nobody, including a particular individual self can alienate these rights. So that should be the starting point of human rights, the talk of human rights, not the Magna Carta. Okay. So Kavya was very intelligent. She found out who was teaching and therefore she didn't take that paper. What paper did you take instead of uh, human rights? Environment, sir. You must have learned something terribly polluted about the environment. <laughs> Um, no, like, uh, I'm not attending classes, sir. I thought of studying by myself. Good, good. Otherwise, you'll only learn polluted environment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> no, no, seriously. It's a, uh, yes. it's a great head, no? Who is taking the that paper? Don't know, sir. Yeah, uh, it, is. it is, it is, it is. And... Uh, you have an awesome threesome in that college. On 28th, there is a recruitment of two more people to take place. Mm -hmm. hmm. To join the awesome threesome. So you will have five people now. Uh. Yeah. So all the best. Enjoy yourself. Prashant, you also will get these people. Hmm? Okay. While the world is studying about other things, you can study about Telangana. That is the beauty of us. All right. Okay. So, nobody, including a particular individual, can alienate these rights. That is the beginning of the talk of human rights. Later on, I mean, not later on, You. this is also the beginning of the talk of civil rights. I shall talk to you about the necessity for civil rights then, of course, you have the constitutional rights. These should have been on the top. When we do the American system, that is when I will talk about these. Okay. So, please remember that it was William and Mary of Orange. And because of the fact that there was a surrendering of rights, there was institutional rebuilding. And it was a good period in the history of England. The parliament 
once again regained what it had lost. The parliament was consulted by William and Mary of Orange in administering or in ruling over England. The crisis happened again when William and Mary of Orange, their rule came to an end. That is when you have the birth of the the Hanoverian dynasty. By the way, which dynasty is ruling or the nominal monarch of England today? Hmm? Anyone? Uh-huh. Bourbon. Bourbons. It is guess. Bourbon. Bourbon is French. Unless you are talking about bourbon, which is Bourbon. Bourbon is also a kind of chocolate, and it's also a alcoholic beverage that you find in America. Bourbon, they call it. The Bourbon dynasty was in France, not in England. That was a French dynasty. It is the Hanoverian dynasty that is still in power. It is in England one of the longest reigning dynasties. And it is because of the Hanoverian dynasty that Britain finally became a democracy and the parliament finally became a legislature. That does not mean that they facilitated this. Don't take that meaning. Okay. It's a slightly longish story. I don't want to start it today. We'll start it on Monday. Monday I'll finish off with this British constitutional thing. Okay. So I'll see you on Monday. Prashant. Sir. Please tell Amulya I missed her today. Yes, sir. Mm, and if she doesn't come to class next time, I will make her teach, teach you all mathematics. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please tell her. Seriously. Mm. Mm, Samya is there somewhere. So, Samya, you also tell her. Ujwala is there. Yes, I saw Ujwala come. Mm. Yes, Ujwala, please tell. And uh, Sir Akshay. Sir Akshay Puneet. Yes, sir. Do you think these are useful? Yes, sir. So just tell some of your friends that these are useful. You have to know these things, by the way. Yes, sir. Let me ask you a question. If the upper house is a house of lords, then how come the lower house has more powers than the upper house? If it has more powers, it should have become the upper house, no? In the Senate also you have, uh, in the US also you have bicameralism. The upper house is the Senate. It has more powers than the lower house, which is the House of Representatives. 
But why is it in England and in India? The lower house is more powerful than the upper house, but still called the lower house. That will get answered once we do the Hanoverian dynasty. Okay. So, just tell some of your friends. Like I said, this is not, I'm not, by the way, thanks to these lectures, I'm getting a lot of traffic on my YouTube. Mm -hmm. hmm? But uh, those are not the people for whom I'm doing this. I'm doing it for my students. Sir, uh, hmm. the duration is somewhat uh, long. Okay. You want it for one hour? Okay. Is yeah, that what? From the topic, from, uh, from the current topic to other topics. Sorry? Sometimes. You are digressing from current topic to other topics uh, in between. Where did I digress? Rights of man. Yeah. I don't, but it, it is in my, that, that might be essential, but uh, it is too, becoming too long. Sir, you have to know these things. You have to know these things if you want to pass your prelims. Hmm? None of these direct digressions are digressions. I'm telling you those. Otherwise, there's no context where I can tell you those things. Where can I tell you that David Hume questioned natural rights? Hmm? Where can I tell you that? So, these are all things that are required. If you want the classes to be shorter, they'll be shorter. Not a problem. But don't think that I'm wasting your time. I no, hope sir. you're not thinking that. No, sir. All these are relevant information. Because Thomas Paine is the first person who wrote about the inalienable rights of human beings. And when constitutional rights were not implemented, which is what we will talk about when we come to the parliament of the USA, when the constitutional rights were not implemented, that is when people started talking about civil rights and human rights. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, my classes are not made easy, Akshay. Okay. I give a lot of details because it is in the details that we get our understanding from. If I tell you with large brush strokes, then you will know something, but you won't know what it is, like Puritanism. <laughs> hmm? Okay. So please tell some of your classmates and if there are others from MA yes, in this group right now, I saw Rekha and I saw Durga Prasad. Uh, please, this is for your benefit I'm doing this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Not, otherwise, I get my... If I just sit and record and put this on YouTube, I'm getting, I'll get my view, viewers. I can even make money. YouTube is telling me that you've become very popular. Monetize your site. I said, no, thank you. I don't want to monetize it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Right. -o. All the best. Bye-bye. Have a nice Sunday. Rakesh, I'll call you tomorrow to discuss your... Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Right. Bye.
थैंक यू सो मच